Because we've grown up listening to propaganda from every corner, we tend to have only a superficial understanding of social problems, and as such, ask the wrong questions. We ask how to become successful, without questioning our culture's idea of success. We ask how we as individuals can make more money, instead of using what we have to make everyone better off. We ask why those poor people aren't spending their money on food like we think they're supposed to, rather than asking why they're poor and why no one's helping them. Maybe we should ask more questions. When you ask why people are poor, you're also asking how other people got wealthy. When you ask where wealth came from, you're also asking where poverty comes from. Let's go a little deeper. I'm Chris, and this is what had to be said. Wealth means being able to live a life of luxury and security relative to the majority. From what we can gather, before the original creation of wealth, what Marx called primitive accumulation, and by the way, you should read about that because it's an essential part of history, people lived in more or less egalitarian societies. But at some point in a few parts of the world, like Egypt and China, some people realized if they were willing to use violence, they could get others to do things for them. Naturally, we don't have any written documents from that time, but the emerging historical evidence indicates that every case of what we think of as an ancient kingdom or empire was created by conquest. A, ba a band of people organized and threatened a larger group with violence unless they did what they said. So they got people to gather or grow their food and build their homes, and of course they got to eat first and they got nicer living conditions than the people they threatened. These proto-states were setting the stage for thousands of years of rule and revolt, empire and collapse, haves and have-nots. The haves use violence to take from and keep down the have-nots. They dress it up in systems with their own justifications, like gods and constitutions, but ultimately, a minority of the population threatens the rest into doing all the work, while that minority lives off the labor of others and forms that society's ruling class. The history of wealth is the unwritten history of poverty. When we talk about history, we usually mean written history, and of course, there's a lot of wisdom in the phrase, history was written by the winners. Where do you think the first rulers we've heard about got their wealth? Picture an ancient ruler in your head. What do you see? Maybe someone dressed in fancy clothes with some pillows and silks and satins and other soft things to sit on whenever they want. Maybe some jewels, gold, perfume, half-naked women. Maybe some people carrying them around on a sedan chair. Where did they get all that? Did people make all those things for them out of kindness? Did they mine gold and diamonds for them because they loved their king? How about the women? Did they just volunteer? No, they complied. Soldiers came to their huts or whatever and took them away. They turned the men, and until recently, children, into workers, the women into sex slaves and servants, and once they invented them, threw the kids into indoctrination camps we now call schools. Along the line, the rich and powerful invented various institutions that would serve them in their pursuit of wealth and power over others. They invented private property, so the land, buildings, factories, etc., that they claimed as their own were protected by men with weapons. So the ruling class had all the best land. How's a medieval peasant supposed to work their way out of poverty with no land? They invented what's now called the rule of law, so as to have a long list of things you aren't allowed to do, millions of reasons to stop you, imprison you, or execute you. They invented money, so people would be 
forced to find ways to get some from those who had it, and then they commodified everything, so nothing was available if you didn't use money. They invented the corporation, so they could continue to pursue wealth without consequences. They invented religion, followed eventually by academia and then other forms of propaganda, to make it all seem natural and acceptable and normal and unavoidable. We're not taught to ask questions about where wealth came from. We're supposed to think of it as the natural order of things. And wealth justifies itself, so if you have some, you must deserve it. But we know from prehistory that we evolved in egalitarian bands, sharing the work, which is why we resent doing other people's work for them. The history books make the wealth of rulers look like some kind of quid pro quo. The peasants work for us, and we benignly provide them with services. We build granaries and aqueducts, because obviously a hierarchical society is the only way those things could possibly get built. We build roads, so we can more easily go to where the peasants live to extract whatever resources they have. And we protect our subjects from people who might invade and do the same thing to them as we do. It's all propaganda. It keeps us fighting amongst ourselves while the wealthy continue to live comfortable lives at our expense. Now, wealth can be destroyed like when an empire collapses, but it mostly gets passed down. Where did today's wealth come from? Well. Who created it? Think about who's poor nowadays. In places like Canada, the US, Australia, Taiwan, Latin America, a lot of the world actually, you might find racialized people are the poorest. In other words, people who've been designated the racial other, distinct from the dominant group, officially considered equal, but because of history, much more vulnerable. They might have had their land stolen from them to be replaced by plantations and manor houses, or more recently, suburbs and malls. They might have been stolen from their land, taken somewhere else as slaves or today used as low-wage workers. Black people enslaved in the U.S. created huge amounts of wealth, many trillions, though the numbers are disputed and trillions more as low-wage workers since slavery. They still haven't reached economic equality with the dominant group, and things don't seem to be moving in that direction. That land and those slaves created enormous amounts of wealth, so that their owners lived in the lap of luxury, but didn't have to work for it. And that wealth is still around, just in new hands. I might direct you to Intellectual Media's newest video if you want to learn more on this topic. Where else is thought of as poor? We think of India as having a lot of poverty. Why? Well, it's easy to blame Indian governments since independence. After all, a lot of them have been very exploitative of the population. But there's no way they can match the rapacity of the British Empire. According to a study you can find in the description, the British Empire took something like $45 trillion in wealth from India. And as you might know from history, they used a lot of that wealth to finance imperial wars and genocides around the world. It's funny because I had heard that the British Empire was a benign empire, giving back maybe even more than it took away. But what did it give India? Railways, so it was easy to take what they wanted from where they wanted. Governments and laws and police, so the native ruling class could carry on the plunder after the British left. They integrated India into the global market, which is great if you own part of the corporations who get rich from that market, 
but not so great if it means your job and your livelihood could vanish with the whims of consumers on the other side of the world. And that's what politicians and economists and so on mean when they talk about development. We're developing and providing aid to their country so that one day they can make shit for us at the lowest wages and because we've already taken everything else from them. And of course, India is just one of a hundred examples of places where resources have been sucked dry or, or which just belong to corporations, where the government's main job is to take money from and protect these corporations, and where the people's job is to work for them until they die. It's done in different ways, in different times and places, but to force someone into labor usually requires some kind of tax. If there's a tax, the people have to engage in wage labor so they can pay it. Cecil Rhodes knew that. He needed workers when he founded the De Beers Diamond Mining Company, so he imposed the tax on the native Africans, along with laws that laid the foundation for apartheid soon after. Have there been any studies on how much wealth he extracted from Africa, from the hands and backs of African people? And if so, do they say anything about how many people are poor today because they're still living through his legacy? The division of land, the structure of the state, the dependence on international markets. And what do we remember him for today? The Rhodes Scholarship. As if he was a benefactor rather than a plunderer and a slaver. It's the same with all rich people. Give a few pennies to charity and nobody asks why so many of your employees have anxiety, depression, or addiction. Some kind of tax is, in fact, one of the few features of all states and the class societies they create throughout history. It's what connects the first states that emerged thousands of years ago with the states of today. They've always taxed their citizens in one way or another, forcing them to pay for their own oppression. Nowadays, taxes mean money, and money, as we know from the late David Graeber, is the flip side of debt. When you tax someone, you're saying they owe you, regardless of what so-called services you actually provide them with. Most of the services we get today are new to the state, but just like the divine right of kings, they serve as justification for an involuntary and parasitic relationship. We live under systems of violence, which I describe in more detail in other videos on this channel, and as a result of those systems, most of the wealth created today goes to the already wealthy. We're forced to use money, forced to beg for it from the people who have it, forced to follow the law, thus reducing the economic opportunities we're allowed to pursue, including making and gathering things for ourselves. How could Jeff Bezos have so much money if not for working desperate employees half to death and taking most of the wealth they create for himself and his shareholders? Which, of course, is why he's so opposed to Amazon workers unionizing. When poor people get together, they can take back the wealth that's been taken from them. Yes, the shareholders put up the capital, but where did they get it from? Who worked so they could have wealth? Anyone can be poor. The system takes from everyone. It only gives to people who already have. Today we talk about shortages and scarcity, but that's because that's precisely how business works. It extends private control over something that could have been publicly available. In other words, it turns things that could be shared by all into things exclusively owned by people who can afford it. There's no food shortage or housing shortage. It's just you're not allowed those things if you don't pay for them. The only way we're legally allowed to survive is by using money. And being poor makes a person desperate for work, of course, willing to accept whatever's handed to them in return for however many hours they're told to work. They spend most of their lives making other people richer while barely hanging on. That's what I mean when I say poverty creates wealth. 
The poor work for the rich and make them richer while remaining forever in poverty. Poor workers have little recourse when bosses refuse to pay them their full wages, which apparently is quite often. As you can see from here, let me know if you need the link to that, but of course you can Google it. But even when bosses pay in full, many people are working 50, 60, 80 hours a week and still not making ends meet. The situation is not natural. It's the product of a system of theft that today is called capitalism, but comes in different guises with every system of social hierarchy. One consequence of being poor is you're always on the brink of total collapse when there are people around you who could easily help you. You might need a car or a truck for work, and if it breaks down, you're screwed. There are wealthy people who could give you a few hundred bucks to get it fixed and wouldn't even notice the loss, but they won't. Other poor people could fix it for free, but they're too busy just trying to survive on their own. What if you get sick and your job doesn't pay for sick days? You might have to work sick just to keep your head above water. Of course, the corporation can afford to pay sick days, but then the stock price might drop slightly. They get told to just get a better job, regardless of whether better jobs are available to them. And we have people dying of exposure right outside buildings that could house them overnight, but which they're not allowed to enter. And even when you have nothing, they still try to take from you. You get fined for sleeping in the park or sleeping in your car. Businesses won't let you in to use the bathroom, so you can't use public space like everyone else. Homeless people get their meager belongings taken away. Depending where they are, they're not allowed to pitch a tent or panhandle, and in some cities in the U.S., it's illegal to provide them with food. To feed hungry people is a crime. To take from hungry people is the law. So I don't think we should be focusing only on one side of the poverty equation. What the rich have, they owe to the poor. When someone tells you poverty is inevitable or the default state of humankind, tell them about the history of poverty. Tell them poor people exist because rich people exist. When they talk about reducing poverty, tell them we can solve poverty by empowering the poor to rise up and take back what has been stolen from them. Thanks.